and we're starting with the invertebrates. And invertebrate is not one phylum. So we're in kingdom animal, but there are actually many phyla of invertebrates. Then all the vertebrates are in their single phylum chordata. But the invertebrates are in many different groups. There's a wide variety of characteristics and, and so on. Um, we sort of are going through roughly in order of simplest to more complex. Okay? And sponges are the simplest animals. Filter feeders, they have cells, um, but no real tissue, no organs or organ systems. Very, very simple. And they're filter feeders. Most of them live in the oceans and attach to the objects filtering water as it goes by. All right, our next group are the cnidarians. These are things, some things you're familiar with, like jellyfish, coral, sea anemones. Um, these are all cnidarians. And sort of what do you know about those organisms? What's one of the defining characteristics? Hello? Oh, he came in late. Yes, thank you. So what's a characteristic of these nidarians? Peter? Um, they uh, don't have a, a spider. Definitely. Okay, that's true of all of these invertebrates. What else? When I say jellyfish, what do you think of Thomas? Sting. Sting. Yeah, because these nidarians have stinging cells. They're called nematocysts, and they're generally in the tentacles. And there are these um, cells that um, that they release and sort of enter the skin of their prey or immobilize their prey and they inject a venom into them. This venom generally immobilizes and kills the prey so that the uh, nidarian can eat it. Um, there's lots of different examples. When you think of jellyfish like this, this is a phase of the jellyfish's life cycle. This is called the Medusa stage, the free living, free swimming stage. Um, there's also another stage called the polyp stage, which is generally a stage when they're sort of um, attached to something, right? Um, and different types of nidarians go through different life cycles. Some, it's mostly the medusa stage. Others, it's mostly the polyp stage and only go to the medusa stage for a short period of time. Sometimes they have complex reproduction. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. So there's a wide variety of ways that these organisms live and reproduce. But um, jellyfish has, is very um, simple, has cells, has tissue, but no real organs. Okay? It has stinging cells in the tentacles, okay? um, and it doesn't have a respiratory system. It absorbs oxygen from the water around it. Um, they have a neural net. They have um, a network of nerve cells, but no, no real brain or anything like that. Some of them live alone. Some live in colonies. Um, so these are jellyfish, and you probably have seen them if you've ever been in the ocean. Sometimes they wash up on shore. Sometimes you have to be careful swimming because there are jellyfish in the water. And they can sting you. They can be very painful. Um, some jellyfish are very um, venomous in that um, their venom can actually kill a person. Okay. Those are pretty rare, but they do exist, and that's part of what I'm going to show you in the video. They have radial symmetry. Okay, if you think about these uh, organisms, they have um, arranged in a, a circular pattern. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a hydra. This is um, mainly the polyp stage, and it's stuck there. This is the base. And at the top are tentacles with stinging cells. This is very small. We'll be looking at it in a microscope. Um, and it has these have one body opening for their digestive system. So they have food goes in one opening, gets digested, and then waste leaves through the same opening. So in these medusa stages, the opening is on the underside of sort of the jelly part between the tentacles surround it. On this polyp stage of the hydra, the opening is right up here in, in between all the tentacles. So they grab a little chunk of food, sting it, kill it, put it inside of their body opening, go in their body to be digested. Now this hydra is going through the process of reproduction asexually. It's called budding. And what you see, this is basically another hydra growing out of the side of this adult hydra. And that's one way that they can reproduce, through budding. Basically it starts growing out of the side, gets larger, breaks off, floats away and becomes its own hydra. So it's a form of asexual reproduction. So really? even though it's like really small, it's staying, it can still be 
the sting of the hydra, you wouldn't feel it at all. Right? But it depends on the size so and the type of venom. No, you could touch these and it wouldn't affect them. This is very, very small, this, this uh, blue berry. But some grow very large, larger than a person. Okay? You can see this uh, jellyfish here. Okay, some live together in colonies. A bunch of jellyfish actually sort of working together. Um, how far away is that person? Not that far. This is big. This is probably about the same size as the person. So they go very, very large. Some are bioluminescent. Um, I'll show you a picture where they can create light um, using chemical reactions within their um, their bodies. But coral, if you know what coral is, or coral reef is also a nadarian. Um, a coral grows generally in colonies of many, many individual organisms, um, and they secrete um, a calcium-based skeleton, which forms a reef. Um, and they generally live with a symbiotic algae, which goes through photosynthesis, and they obtain their nutrition through that. Um, so pretty interesting. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse and productive ecosystems on Earth because there's a wide range of habitats for other species to live within the reef. Anemones, another um, polyp stage of a nadarian okay, with their tentacles, their stinging cells, the body opening for food to go into. And again, there's the bioluminescent jellyfish. Many of these can live deep in the ocean. They produce light um, to attract prey um, so that they can consume it. And then the clownfish, you've heard the story, I'm sure, which lives symbiotically with the uh, sea anemone. All right, so those are the nadarians. Now I want to show you this video about box jellyfish in Australia. Uh, again, some of the most um, venomous creatures um, that we know of. through the stinger nets that protect swimmers. Each morning, the lifeguards patrol inside the nets for the deadly jellies. If they find one, they close the beach. But finding none is no guarantee for safety. Jenny wants to thwart a sneak attack altogether. But how do you detect a creature the size of your fingernail and invisible to boot? You search for its prey. Jamie suspects the tiny Irukanji feeds on the tiny fish that feed on the even tinier plankton. Trawling for plankton isn't foolproof, but just because you don't find jellies doesn't mean they aren't here. But it's Jamie's best hope. Success. Plankton galore. To be certain, Jamie and Teresa take a closer look. It's risky, but they're used to calculated risk. <coughs> the dive suit shields them from the venomous stingers, but it has an Achilles heel. The face. This time, Jamie's luck has run out. Jamie is stunned. First aid for a jellyfish sting is calcium. 
Sigma Phi Kappa doesn't stop the pain, but it stops some fire stingers from firing. Jane is not the only victim. A broken tentacle on Teresa's glove flicks her skin. <coughs> it's all it takes. <laughs> So she had one just on her glove, and when she took it off, it stung her. The venom takes about 20 minutes to enter your bloodstream. Then, the worst pain of your life. No antidote exists. All doctors can do is to treat your symptoms and manage your pain. Ever the scientist, Jamie analyzes his own agony. I started to come back again. It's not more pain. It's not, not lower back pain or chest pain. It's just complete total pain right throughout the body. Oh, dear. Teresa suffers even worse. Pain so intense. The maximum dose of morphine barely takes the edge off. Blood pressure can skyrocket, and so does the endless staircase of pain. Whether you live or die depends on your blood vessel's ability to handle the pressure. Oh, stomach hurts. I've got really quite bad lower back pain, like yeah. Um, my spine's getting crushed. Yeah, pain is like up in my diaphragm and, and just like cramps down and out in my arms. Just you know, my arms are killing me. I feel like I can do this on the other side of it. The screen is screen away, which is a bit of a worry. Um, all, to be honest, I'm more concerned about her than I'm more concerned for myself at this point in time. Irritation is venom triggers a whole syndrome of reactions, from pain to cramps to nausea. Because doctors must know what's coming next, putting a patient under is risky. No single painkiller works for everyone, except the time. It's all right. It's um, a little clock, so a little to 20, 20 hours, 20, 20 hours. Teresa will suffer for two weeks. Jamie for two days. I'm thinking of elephants. They're big, they're and there's lots of them. And don't sting. Oh dear. I wish you'd go and work with Carlos Flecker. At least the pain goes away after 20 minutes or you die on the arm. It doesn't matter, it's so. Hang on, that guy has hell on. That's just so weird. Don't say, don't ever say jellyfish, it's a stupid thing to do. Oh, maybe those will be safer again. Horrible things. Yes, when the pain ebbs, passion returns. Alright, so you can see that's one of the most venomous jellyfish. And it's not the initial sting, but as that venom gets into the bloodstream, then it starts all those all those symptoms that we saw those those people having to deal with. Alright. So let's get on to something other than jelly. Worms. Oh, this is another gross one. Alright, worms. 
Um, there's actually three main phylum of worms. There's nematodes, which are round worms. There's platyhelminthes, which are flat worms. And then there's annelida, which are segmented worms. But they're all worms. And where there's a very large variety of worms, most have two body openings. Okay, again, so food goes in one, waste comes out the other. So that's sort of a, uh, another step up in terms of um, evolution, in terms of body plan. And includes things that you're familiar with, like worms, earthworms. Okay, earthworm's a segmented worm. You could see on its body each of those little segments. That's where the name comes from. Um, and there's a wide variety of segmented worms. Um, there's also, these are flatworms. These are marine flatworms that live in the oceans. Kind of like really bright, vibrant colors. They swim through the ocean. Um, this is one we're going to look at. This is planaria, another flatworm. Okay, and planaria, interestingly, have an amazing ability to regenerate. You basically take a planaria, if you cut it in half, each half will grow into a new planaria. Okay? Um, and so we're going to be looking at them later this week. Yeah. Um, this is an earthworm, obviously, uh, sort of cut away through the ground. And earthworms are extremely beneficial for the soil in, in several ways. The whole tunnels that they dig through the soil allow oxygen to get into the roots of various plants, so it's very helpful. They also eat little or bits of organic material from the soil, digest it, and their excrement, their waste products, um, are helpful to the soil as sort of a fertilizer. You know, if you've ever been like playing around in the backyard and you see these little clusters of stuff that you thought were like mud or whatever, you know what it really was? Yeah. And so you pick those things up and crumble them and throw them at your brother and stuff. It's basically earthworm excrement, okay? Um, so now you know. Um, but that stuff is very good for the soil. In fact, you could order earthworms for your garden. You could get them shipped to you in a big bag of earthworms and dump them into your soil. Um, again, because they're so beneficial for the, for the soil. But some are not so beneficial to humans. This is a leech. A leech is an annelid, a segmented worm. And leeches um, live in generally fresh water. And they're parasites. They um, attach to an animal. And they have in their saliva some special chemicals. One type of chemical is um, sort of like a, um, an anesthetic so that you don't feel the bite of the earthworm, so it's not painful. And they also have anticoagulant chemicals so that your blood doesn't coagulate, so the animal's blood. Because they live on blood, they attach, they bite the person or the animal, and then they live off of that blood. They fill up with blood, and then they sort of, once they're filled with blood, they detach, sort of just drop, digest that blood as their source of nutrition, and then once they've digested, they could go on to find uh, another prey organism. Um, so do you no, you don't die, I mean, they don't, I mean, you ever see the movie Stand By Me, old movie? The kids that go, they find a dead body, and yeah. yeah. And eventually they go they go in that like pond area, they come out and they have leeches all over them. Oh no, they don't kill you. Um, they actually, and they're also used in medicine. They used to be used frequently, um, you know, in sort of medieval times. Um, but they're still used today, actually, in certain types of medical treatment. We're gonna watch a video about that sometime this week. Yeah, that would, or I mean, you really could just pull it off um, and get rid of it. Um, here. Um, I saw another movie where the leeches were kind of jumping out of the water. Oh, really? They over exaggerated. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they actually do that, but. Yep, do it. Not generally, not that I know of. Um, no, they don't. Uh, another type of worm, um, parasitic worms, flatworms and roundworms, there are certain types that can be parasitic. Um, and so these are the mouth parts of a parasitic worm, and they basically hook on inside of an animal's digestive tract. Right? Some kind of affect humans. Um, and this is a flatworm, parasitic flatworm. See its body, and you can see its body is made of all these little segments. These worms get into the digestive system of an animal, 
lactons, and then as the animal eats, they absorb nutrients from that food as it passes through the digestive tract. So as the food's going by, the earth, the um, worm absorbs some of it, and that's how they get energy. They grow larger and larger, and they can reproduce. One way that they spread is that um, a little piece of this worm, one of the sections actually breaks off once in a while, comes out in the animal's waist. You know, when I, I had a dog, the first dog that we had in our new house, uh, I was taking her in the, in the back to the bathroom one time, and I looked down at the little present she left, and on top was a tiny little white thing about like a grain of rice, and it started moving around, and so I knew that she had, a, she was infested with some sort of worm, so we took her to the bat and she got a, a pill. Basically take one medication, one pill, and that will kill the worms inside of the, uh, inside of your dog or the other animal. If a person gets infected with a parasitic worm, same thing, they can take medications to help um, kill the worms. But it's pre pretty common. And what would happen is after my dog went to the bathroom, if another dog from the neighborhood like was in our yard sniffing around, you know what dogs do, uh, that dog ingested that tapeworm, it would then be infected and it could start to grow inside of that dog. And that's how it spreads from dog to dog. Um, has anyone ever had really young puppies before? Anyone ever had a dog that had puppies? Did you ever have to deworm them? You know what that means? You have to give them, right? Puppies, when puppies are born in the birthing process or soon after, they almost all get infected with tape, with worms, digestive tapeworms. And so one of the things to get a dog ready to be adopted or to get is to have them deworm. Basically, just take a medication that you give to the puppy uh, and it basically kills the worm. Why was it? We got our our second dog. It was pretty young, so it hadn't been dewormed yet when we got it. So we had to give we had to give her the deworming medication. So we gave it to her. She was a tiny little puppy. She was a trial mix. She was you know about this big. But after giving her the deworming medication, the stuff that came out when she went to the bathroom was bigger than her. It looked like a plate of spaghetti, just huge worms that were, you know, this long out of a tiny little dog. Um, Kimberly? So, like, say, like, the dogs that reproduce, so the mom, like, say it didn't have worms, but the baby's just automatically... No, so if, the, if the mother doesn't have them, the babies might not, but they almost all get infected at some point. So almost they, all they dogs. they get infected even yeah. though they're not. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it clogs up. As these worms grow larger, I'll show you a picture of it. As they get larger, reproduce more and more worms can form a blockage in the digestive tract. Do you? Oh, I was watching a show. It's called House, and it's on like a tapeworm in them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it wasn't like something that actually happens, but it shows if something happened to you, what would happen? And they grow. Like, yeah, they got huge. 32. Yeah, and they could clog up pork roundworm. I have pictures, basically clog up the digestive system completely uh, if it's infected. Like some of these worms migrate to the brain, lay eggs in the brain. There's all sorts of. Uh, anyone have? If you have a dog, you give it that heart guard medication. That's uh, to prevent um, a type of worm called heartworm. Heartworm is a, a worm, a parasitic. I believe it's a flatworm. It might be a roundworm, but it lives in the circulatory system living off of blood inside of your dog. And again, if it grows, if it reproduces, it can become so big that it clogs up their circulatory system. This is the heart of a dog that died from this heartworm. And all the white stuff looks like yarn or rubber bands. That's the worm. And so it's grown and reproduced so much it completely clogged up this dog's heart so that it would no longer function. So that's why you give dogs um, those medications. All right, well, that's fun. Any other questions about worms? Oh, yeah, this I forgot this one. This is a picture of somebody's leg and foot. Oh, God. Oh, a picture is a bit different. This is uh, of a disease called elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is um, caused by a parasitic worm that can get into a person's body, and it lives in a person's lymphatic system. So throughout our body, we have vessels that carry body fluid around. Just like our blood, we have blood vessels that carry blood. Lymphatic vessels carry fluid and redistribute around our body. Well, this worm gets into the lymphatic system, 
reproduces, grows, and eventually starts clogging it up. So now fluid, body fluid from this person's body, can't get back into circulation, starts to collect, usually in the lower extremities, in the feet, in the legs, okay? uh, and basically cause it to swell up to huge proportions. This is a mild, a fairly mild um, infection. Um, sometimes people can no longer walk. Um, and there's some very extreme examples of elephantiasis, but you can see their leg, lower legs completely deformed because of this extra fluid that's built up inside of them. What's that? The worm, I mean, there are treatments and medications. Um, elephantiasis is you know, generally more of a problem in poor countries, often places with not great sanitation so that the worm could spread uh, from person to person more easily. All right, let's talk about some, something better. Mollusks, all right? These are lots of things you eat, so it's maybe less gross, I don't know. Mollusks, another group, mollusca, phylum mollusca, includes a, of a variety of different invertebrates. They have soft bodies, called the mantle, uh, and many of them have a shell, either on the outside or on the inside. Includes things like snails, okay, snails, create a shell. What's that? Slugs. Yeah, it's basically a, a snail without the shell. Okay, slugs that you probably see in your backyard. You go out and walk in the morning and see lots of slugs. Or you might accidentally step on one of your feet. That's really gross and it's smush. Um, but they they're herbivores. They live on plants and stuff. Clams, oysters, scallops. These are another type of mollusks. They're called bivalves. It means two shells. Okay, um, many of them are filter feeders. Um, they suck in water, filter out little bits of food from it, and send it out. Um, and, you know, this is the foot of a clam. This is a bivalve. And basically they can, this little muscular foot, they can open up their shell. They put this foot out and they use it to move around, to sort of burrow into the sand or into the soil and stuff. Um, and they filter out food. So, you know, if you eat clams, what you're, you open up the clam, what you have in there is basically all of the body systems of that clam, all of its reproductive system and its digestive system, it's all there um, inside of that, of that shell. Octopus and squid are um, another, they're cephalopods, it's another type of mollusk. Um, they're more advanced, they have you know, well-developed nervous systems and so forth. Um, they have, really interesting abilities to camouflage themselves and so on to watch a video that shows some, some neat stuff that they can do. But that includes octopus and squid. You know, giant squid is one of the largest, it is the largest invertebrate animal. They grow to extremely large sizes, very sort of mysterious. Scientists never really seen them in uh, alive. They, they get washed up on shore once in a while and scientists find them, but for a long time they never seen them living in their native habitat. They did. Um, you know, several years ago, but it's sort of this really uh, interesting uh, type of uh, invertebrate. I was watching the History Channel, and someone from the ocean did a movement on giant squid. Yeah. And it was like kind of washed up on shore, and they kind of came to the museum. Oh, yeah. It's like as big as a school. Yeah, they're huge. Um, so for the mollusks, the kinoderms, the name means spiny skin. They, they have skeletons um, and sometimes spines like the sea urchin. They generally have radial symmetry. They have one body opening for food and waste, includes starfish, um, includes um, sand dollars, things like that. Okay, those are animals. I told you this the other day. This video is not all that exciting, but you can at least see uh, sand dollars. You know, they move around. The kinoderms have these two feet. Um, they can use to move around and, and yeah, it moves in sort of a spiral pattern, basically filtering little bits of food out from the sand and the water. Um, that's what it uses as nutrients. You know, starfish have a really amazing ability also to regenerate. If you cut a starfish, any part of the starfish that has some of a central disc that's in the middle in it can regrow into a completely new starfish. You know, fishermen used to be annoyed when they catch starfish, so they chop them up and throw them back in the water. But in reality, they were just causing more starfish before because they can regenerate. Right. Uh, and last group, arthropods. Arthropods, the largest group. 
What does the root pod mean? Like pseudopod? Feet. Feet. Yeah, this means jointed feet. Because arthropods secrete an exoskeleton. But an exoskeleton, a shell, in order to be helpful, if you think about like a suit of armor. If I had a suit of armor and the arms were just two cylinders of metal, would I be very good at jousting? No, what would I need? What do you need in a suit of armor? You need joints. You need sections where the external skeleton can move. And that's what they have. So, for example, the ant has this hard exoskeleton, but with these gaps, which are joints that allow for movement. Okay? Um, they have segmented bodies, bilateral symmetry, and an exoskeleton. There are about 75% of all animals are arthropods. It includes several different um, classes. There's um, crustaceans, which include lobsters, crayfish, crabs. Um, there's millipedes, centipedes, insects, and arachnids are the main groups. Um, and you know, this exoskeleton is helpful in terms of protection, but it doesn't grow. Once an exoskeleton is formed, it's based that size. So how do insects and other arthropods grow? Yes, they molt. They come out of their shell, break out of their exoskeleton, grow larger, and then produce a new exoskeleton. But in that time after they've molted, they're vulnerable because they don't have that protective shell. <coughs> if you look up here, I have a little exoskeleton from a beetle. We have these on our swings in our backyard all the time in the spring in the summer because it's like soft cedar. So the beetles can grab onto it, hold on, and they break out of the back of their exoskeleton. You can see where it's split in the back. And they leave, they go grow larger. And what's left are these exoskeletons stuck on different things. You ever seen those? No, never saw them? All right, check that out on your way out. It's kind of neat. My daughters always just be scared of them. Um, but again, an exoskeleton is basically a suit of armor for these arthropods. Yeah. What's the, uh, I always wondered what the part the, on the back of that